Hello and welcome back to uh, the City of Santa Clarita's uh, Structural Training for Residential. I'm John Caporelli and uh, this is part four of our training. Uh, we've uh, been talking about uh, residential wood frame. We're using an example home uh, to talk about some of the building code requirements and uh, also to not just talk about code but talk about physics and why, why things are the way they are when, when we talk about structures and structural behavior. Uh, now is kind of the best part of the presentation where we're going to jump in. We're going to talk about, go back to our example home, and we're going to start applying some of these concepts to the, uh, to the example home. So let's go ahead and, and uh, take another look. Uh, now, uh, what I've done for you here is I've taken our, our house, uh, isometric drawing, and I've kind of split it up into the separate floors. Okay, and if you remember from our house plan, um, the roof of our house was supported by shear walls on both ends. So we had a shear wall line here and a shear wall line here. The, uh, in an earthquake, when a house shakes, the forces are generated uh, by mass. So the heavy parts of a structure are what create the seismic force. And so the roof itself is what generates that force when a house is shaking. And so that force uh, you can see by these, by these uh, two arrows, that force has to transfer uh, from the roof to the shear walls. So here to here and here to there. So to kind of illustrate that point, I'm kind of showing the force like it's being imparted on the house this way. Uh, but in actuality, the force is actually being generated by the weight of the house itself. Okay, And then the first floor... Uh, if you remember from our house plan, and we're going to take another look at the house plan in a minute, but uh, the first floor has three shear walls, okay? One at the rear, one here inside the house, kind of at the back of the garage, and then another shear wall line up here at the front of the garage. And so you'll notice it's the same, conceptually it's very much the same. I've got uh, force here that's uh, acting in this direction, and that force transfers to these three shear walls. Okay. Now, another th important thing to notice is these shear walls on the outside are going to carry force from both the roof and the floor. So whatever, uh, whatever force I have here transfers from the roof to the second floor shear walls, and then when it comes down to the next level, that force combines with the force at the second floor. And so those shear walls at the first level support the entire house. And uh, that's required by the code. You'll see the way the code reads here. A load path to the foundation shall be provided for uplift shear and compression forces. Okay, Elements resisting shear wall forces contributed by multiple stories shall be designed for the sum of the forces uh, contributed by each story. So as you move down a house, the shear wall forces will increase. So you'll, you'll expect that the shear walls on the first level of a house, the amount of shear walls and the strength of the shear walls and so forth, are going to be higher because the shear force builds. It, 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 it's, it builds as you go down. Okay. Another important thing to mention about the new code uh, is the seismic forces have gone up. Uh, if, if, uh, if you've been in the business, uh, construction business for a number of years, you'll remember under the UBC, uh, we had a certain level of seismic forces that we designed for. And when the, in 2007, when the international codes were adopted by California, those seismic forces actually dropped. And we saw, in some cases, about a 20 to 30 percent drop in uh, seismic forces from the UBC to the IBC. So that was back in 2007. Okay. Now, the, uh, in 2014, the 2013 CBC is now uh, applicable. And under that code, the seismic forces have been increased again, back to essentially where they were uh, under the UBC. So uh, important thing to keep in mind is that we are, we are back to where we were under the UBC. Forces aren't any higher than they were, really, but basically they went down a little bit, and now they're back up. Okay, here's our, here's our uh, uh, floor plans uh, for our house, our roof plan, floor plan, and foundation plan for our house. And this is uh, identical to the plan that you saw in part one of our training. And if you're following along 
with the presentation online, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll uh, have a, be able to see this uh, uh, as well. Uh, the difference with this diagram is now we've added the uh, seismic forces that are acting. So it's not just the framing plan, which is shown here in, in, in black. It's also in, in green, the seismic forces that we're designing for. And these are the same seismic forces we saw on the last slide. Um, so notice, on the roof we have a shear wall uh, here at the back of the house and another shear wall here at the front of the house and there's no shear walls in between. So all of that uh, seismic force that's generated when, when, when the house is shaking this way, all of that seismic force that's generated is transferred to that wall and that wall and it's being resisted by those shear walls. Okay, And you'll notice the seismic shear at the roof, and this is a real example. I mean, this, this, these numbers are not just sort of pulled out of thin air. This is what you would expect in Santa Clarita, more or less, designing a house. The, the seismic shear force at the roof level alone is about 10,000 pounds, 10,300 uh, 10, pounds. Okay, so that 10,000 pounds is going to generate about 5,000 pounds in this wall and about 5,000 pounds in that wall. So when we go to look at our shear walls, we're designing shear walls to support about 5,000 pounds of load on each side of the house. Okay, so that's the force in green. Now let's go from the uh, roof level, second floor shear walls. Let's drop down to the second floor level and first floor shear walls. And that's what's uh, depicted on this plan here. Now, the second floor shear uh, is going to be somewhere around 6,500 pounds. All right. Now notice that the shear generated by the roof is actually higher than the shear generated by the floor. That's a function of the weight of the roof. You know, we've got a tile roof, so the roof's going to weigh a little bit more than the floor. And it's also generated by the height. The farther you get from the ground, the more acceleration you get. The more acceleration you get, the more force you get. And so in most homes, the shear generated by the roof is quite a bit more than the shear generated by the floor. So going back to this example, the shear forces at the floor are indicated in blue, but unlike the roof, the uh, second floor has shear walls at the rear, at the middle, and at the front. And so those shear forces generated by the second floor can be carried by three separate walls. And so you'll see there's three lines of resistance, one, two, and three. All right. Now, as we showed in the prior diagram, as you move down the house, as those forces transfer from where they're generated down to the foundation, they build in the walls. So this force here at the roof will transfer down to this wall. So notice, I've got the blue shear from the second floor plus the green shear from the roof for a total shear here indicated in purple. So uh, that number in purple uh, is what we're going to be designing the shear walls for. And it works out to about 6,500 pounds. So you remember, we had about 5,000 pounds for the roof shear walls. And then by the time we come down to the second floor, that force has increased to about 6,500 pounds. Okay? Now, it didn't increase much because Again, we have this middle shear wall at the second floor. That middle shear wall is going to suck up most of the force from the second floor. And so the contribution of force to the rear wall is only this small piece, whereas that middle shear wall is taking all of that shear. And then the front wall is only taking maybe a piece of shear about like that. Um, so th this plan illustrates the behavior of, of a structure. And so it's a good thing to, 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 to develop a good understanding for if you're designing homes or building homes is uh, where's that shear going? You know, you, you know uh, if you see an interior shear wall, that interior shear wall is going to take a lot of load because right in the middle of the house, there's a lot more area that's tributary to that wall, and so it's going to suck up a lot more force. Whereas when you see a plan like this that does not have an interior shear wall, you're going to realize, well, since there's no lateral support here in the middle of the house, the shear all has to be carried on those outside walls. Okay? Likewise, when you see a house, you can expect that the shear walls on the, on the first floor 
the overturning and the shear forces are going to be higher on the first floor than the second floor. Because remember what the code said, you have to combine those forces as you work your way down the, down the structure. Okay, and then lastly, we end up here on our foundation. The foundation will just be designed for those purple forces, right? That purple force includes the roof, the second floor, the second floor walls, and the first floor walls is all included in this uh, purple, uh, purple force. Okay, uh, last thing I want to mention on this plan is you can see the, uh, the little diamonds here indicate what the, what the shear walls are uh, to resist those forces. So, um, you know, uh, let, let, let's take a simple example here. Uh, here at the first floor we have shear wall A is 20 feet long and you'll notice that the shear force on this wall is, uh, it looks like somewhere around 2,500 pounds. Okay, so um, the amount of shear per foot in this wall is only going to be something maybe around 100, 150 pounds per lineal foot. You know, if, if I have uh, about 2,000, 2,500 pounds in a wall and the wall's 20 feet long, uh, you know, 2,000, 2,500 divided by 20, I'm a, I'm a little over 100, maybe 100, 150 pounds per lineal foot. Uh, as we saw earlier in the training, uh, part two of our training, that's no problem for a shear wall. And you'll see we've got uh, shear wall A down here in our schedule, and uh, it's good for about uh, 500 pounds per lineal foot, and uh, that's you know, more than enough to support the uh, shear that's generated in that wall. Okay? But uh, on the same point, if I come down here to this wall, these shear walls are a lot shorter, and so I, start, I have to use heavier shear walls uh, to support heavier forces. And in fact, uh, for wall C, we're actually using a manufactured shear wall. Um, wood shear walls, as you saw in part two of the training, are only good for a certain maximum amount of force. I mean, there, there's only so much force you can, you can put on a wood shear wall. When you start exceeding that level of force, you start having to look into other ways of supporting the building. And in this case, uh, we're using a uh, manufactured shear wall, which is usually either a uh, steel wall or it might be just a very high quality wood wall, uh, but those are also available to take uh, uh, heavier seismic forces. So um, kind of stepping back and, and looking at this plan now overall, and I'm going to kind of uh, step out so we can see the whole frame. Um, at this point, we've really talked about all of the components of, of, our, of our house. We've talked about the roof framing, we've talked about the floor framing, we've talked about the shear walls, why they're there and how they behave. And so uh, at this point, looking at this plan, um, you know, we really have a feeling, you know, now here in part four of the training, we really have a feeling for why all of these elements are there and, uh, and how, they all, uh, how they all behave. Uh, we're going to go ahead and go on. Now, uh, what I've provided for you here is an elevation view of the uh, rear wall of our house. And all of the forces that we were just talking about in the floor plans, you can see those same forces here, but depicted as an elevation view. And so you can see the, the roof shear in green uh, coming through the roof sheathing, transferring down to the top plate. So step one is roof diaphragm shear, step two is the, the sheathing above the top plate, step three is the top plate itself, and notice uh, how I say the top plate drags the load to the shear walls. So the shear in the roof here is a shear per foot, and that transfers down. So along here I have shear per foot. Once I get into that top plate, remember the top plate is what we call a collector, and so all the shear here in the middle there is no shear wall here in the middle to resist it. The shear walls are on this end and this end. Now, did they have to be that way? No, this is just how we designed our house. We could have put a shear wall here in the middle, but we decided not to, okay, or the engineer decided not to. So for our example, I've got a shear wall here and a shear wall here. Well, the shear is coming in uniformly across this, uh, this, this piece of the roof. How does that uniform shear here in the middle get to these walls? The answer is that top plate takes that shear and transfers it uh, and it collects it. So the force in the top plate will build, 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 and then when it hits the shear wall, it'll unload into the shear wall. And likewise on the other side of the, of the, uh, 
of the house. Okay, now so so you can understanding now that we understand the physics and how these structures behave, you can almost see the forces traveling through the building. You know, you knowing where the shear walls are and so forth, you can see that chain, that structural load path, or that chain analogy that we used. You can see it transferring through. Okay, now. Uh, Let's revisit what we know about shear walls. This piece right here is a shear wall, right? I have a force that's pushing on the top of the shear wall, right? When, when, when the earthquake comes and this thing shakes, this is pushing. That force has to transfer through to here. And at the same time, if I push here, I'm going to generate overturning, rocking forces on this wall, indicated by these arrows, all right? Now, how are those overturning forces resisted? By those steel straps. Remember in part one, we talked about those steel straps that go from floor to floor? Well, now you're seeing the application of those straps. And when you go out and look at tracked homes or designed or spec tracked homes, you see those steel straps. What are those doing? They're tying the shear walls down. Okay? So that's step four of our shear transfer. Now, uh, in blue, you see the floor coming in, uh, the floor shear coming into the equation. So the roof shakes, the floor shakes, and generates uh, shear force as well. And so that blue shear force from the floor combines with the uh, green shear force from the roof to generate the purple arrows uh, shown on the on the diagram. Now, at the first floor, uh, we have a shear wall here in the middle. Didn't have that up here. Up here, the designer only designed shear walls here and here. Down here, I've got a shear wall right here in the middle, along with shear walls here and over here on the other side. What does that mean? Well, that means that the shear force doesn't have to travel as far. Up here, the shear force had to travel all the way over here and unload. Down here, I've got a shear wall here. So see how these arrows are a lot shorter uh, for, the, for the top plate? That's because the shear is only traveling a few feet to get from where it's generated to where it's being resisted. So the, the structural chain is a lot shorter. Um, so you would expect the top plate splice force here at the first floor to be a lot less. There's a lot more shear wall along here, so the top plate force is going to be a lot lower. All right. Now, once the shear from the second floor and the first floor uh, hits this level, now the shear walls at the first floor have to, have to transfer the combined shear from both levels from this point down to the foundation. Okay? And you'll notice that the rocking effect, the overturning effect generated combines from one level to another. So whatever overturning uplift I have here you know, on this level is going to add to the overturning uplift at the second level. And so the forces down here at the foundation are going to be a lot higher than the forces uh, up here at the roof. And you can, you can see that. I've actually done the calculations uh, here. Up here, I've got about 4,000 pounds of, of tension when that wall tries to overturn on the second floor. When I transfer down here to the foundation, that 4,000 pounds is added to the shear at the second floor for a net total of about 7,400 pounds. So the total uplift force, the cranking sort of rocking force that's trying to turn that shear wall over is about 7,400 pounds. That's where we find our hold downs. So you're going to have everywhere you have an arrow here, you're going to have a hold down. Whatever hold down goes here has got to support at least 7,400 pounds. Okay? Now here in the middle, you'll notice there is no shear wall here. So there is no overturning force up here that has to transfer down below. So notice what the overturning force is. These arrows are a lot smaller. This level, I've only got 3,000 pounds of overturning here on these two walls. Okay. So as a designer, uh, an architect, engineer, or a, or a builder, or an inspector, um, when you go out and look at a house like this, you can see the way the forces flow. You can see. Uh, that, you know, if I have an interior shear wall here with no shear wall above, I can expect a fairly light shear wall with light hold downs. Whereas if I see a shear wall like this that's two stories tall, I'm going to expect to see uh, quite a bit heavier hardware at the base of that wall. Uh, here's another elevation, this time the front of our house, 
and uh, the garage uh, opening. What you'll notice here is you've got shear from the roof coming down and uh, transferring uniformly into this shear wall. Now this shear wall is a perforated shear wall. You remember when we talked about shear walls, we talked about walls that were tied um, so that they act like one piece. They're tied with steel straps and plywood in the middle of the, in the not only in the walls, but in the, in the uh, between the walls. And that's what we have here. So you notice it's all hatched. I've got plywood here in the middle, plywood here, and then I've got these steel straps uh, above and below the openings. So this whole wall here acts like one wall. So what does that get us? Well, instead of in the last example, we had, if you remember, we had hold downs here and another hold down here. But because this wall now acts like one piece, there's no net overturning on that wall, right? The, the wall is behaving like a single wall, so that rocking effect that creates those forces where you need hold downs and straps, that rocking effect is canceled out by the length of the wall. To, to, to tip over a wall that's this short doesn't take much force but to tip over a wall that's, that's much longer requires a lot more force. So uh, you'll notice on a, on, a, on a design like this, we've traded the steel straps for the hold downs or, or vice versa. Uh, so that's what's happening in this example. So otherwise the load path is the same. You know, shear generated here, comes into the shear walls, comes down. Then I've got the shear at the second floor that's being added to that, all right? Now, all the shear from the, from the roof and the second floor comes down and it lands on this beam over the garage opening, the, the garage header beam, right? So that header beam acts as our collector. If you remember, we were talking about collectors. Uh, all of the force that's generated comes down and then the garage beam has to take that force and collect it and transfer it over to the shear wall. So half the force will transfer to this wall, the other half the force will transfer to that wall. Okay, But that beam is going to have quite a bit of force in it, you know, pulling on it, quite a bit of, of, of collector force, seismic force pulling on it. All right, That beam has to transfer all that force into this wall and then down. And then you'll notice the base of these manufactured walls is pretty skinny. What that means is you're going to have a lot of overturning forces. If I, if I push here, that force is going to want to overturn the wall and you're going to get a lot of rocking forces. So on these manufactured shear walls, you can expect heavy hold downs. Uh, you know, in, in, in some cases, the hold downs on these walls are one and a quarter inch hardened steel, uh, you know, uh, 55 KSI or even heavier steel uh, all thread rod and they're buried quite deep. You'll also notice that the foundations for these manufactured shear walls are usually heavier than the foundations for the rest of the house. You have a grade beam or some other type of heavier foundation for those. It's quite common. Uh, so all the steps uh, are essentially conceptually the same. It's just how they're resisted is different. Okay, shear force at the roof, perforated shear wall, shear force at the floor combines, goes into the garage header, transfers through the garage header, to the shear wall, down to the foundation, heavy overturning forces, and then a grade beam to transfer that force uh, to, the, to the soil. Okay, so, so those are two examples of the front and the back of, of our example home that same forces basically, but illustrate much different ways of resisting those forces and designing for them. Okay, let's talk about uh, some of the specific details for our house. Here's an example where I have a shear wall here and I have a floor beam and I've got a steel strap and you see this is a typical detail that you see on a lot of residential construction. Now what's going on here? Well this shear wall stops right here, right? And then there's an opening that the beam uh, heads out the opening. Well I've got seismic forces pulling on that beam. Those seismic forces have to transfer to the shear wall and the way that's accomplished is through this steel strap. Okay, A lot of details, remember, sometimes designers, uh, builders, uh, inspectors, you know, plan trackers, sometimes we don't think in three dimensions. This is a good example. You've always got to think in three dimensions. 
If this strap wasn't here, well, this works perfectly. If we're only thinking about vertical loads, great. But we've got seismic forces. And so we've always got to think about all the different directions that those forces can be, can be resisted. OK, uh, let's talk about our garage uh, header connection. So this detail, if you look at your example plans, if you're following, following along with the presentation, you'll see this detail too occurs. This is our uh, garage header right here. This, this beam spans this way. And then that frames into our shear wall. Now, as we talked about in the uh, two slides prior, there's a, a large seismic force that's being generated up here by the roof and the second floor. That seismic force is being transferred down and the garage header is collecting that force along the length. Then all of that force has to transfer into the shear wall. Remember the analogy of the, of the chain. So the, the, the beam is one link in the chain. Then when we come here, the shear wall is another link in the chain. But between them, you have these screws. So all of that force has to transfer through these screws to get, in, to get into the, uh, to the shear wall. Now, as an alternate, you know, in, in, instead of this detail here, what if we had this detail here? Okay, in this example, the garage header was not run over the shear wall. It stops right there, and, and it's sitting on a, on a post instead. Okay, now what's wrong with that? Well, the problem there is all of that force that's being collected by that beam if the beam stops short of the shear wall, there's no way for that force to get in, get into that element, right? Even though I've got screws here that go into this block, there, there's no connection between the beam and the, and the block, okay? And so what I've shown here in purple is you'd have to add a strap, okay? This detail, the way it's drawn would not work because you're missing a link in the structural chain. You're missing a part of, the, of your load path. So what I'd have to do is put a steel strap right there. And then what that does is it takes that uh, tension force in the beam and safely transfers it through the strap into the block, into the screws, and then into the shear wall. All right. And these are, these are uh, real world common examples of what our inspectors see in the field. Uh, you know, on the plans, the plans show the detail like this. The builder built it like this. Okay? And our inspectors uh, you know, are trained to um, identify these things and uh, get them fixed, okay? Uh, or, or, or require them to be fixed. As a designer, an engineer, a builder, you know, um, you should be aware of those issues and why. You know, why is it that those issues are important? Here's a photo of that same uh, scenario. So uh, this, is a, this is a slightly different way of achieving the same result. Now notice, this is a manufactured shear wall at a garage, just like in our example home. And here's the garage header coming across. And notice the header stops short of the shear wall. But notice we have a double top plate here. That is our collector element. Okay, if I have a continuous double top plate here, then, the, then I don't really need the beam to take the, the uh, seismic force. Now, I still need the beam for vertical, obviously, to support all the vertical weight. But I can transfer all the seismic force through that top plate. So, you know, I'm showing this as another possible load path to an engineered shear wall. Okay, and another instance where the top plate splice is extremely important. That double top plate has to be spliced. If, if this top plate was cut right here, big problem, right? We've just broken the, broken, taken a link out of our, out of our uh, structural chain, as it were. OK, let's talk about some roof details. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, talk about areas where you have discontinuities. So here in our roof, if you remember, the shear is generated in the roof, and it transfers to the shear walls. So shear is, is being transferred through. So anytime you have a break like this in a structure, you have to design that break to transfer the forces from one side to the other. 
And that's what, uh, that's what we're showing here. So you'll notice uh, on this detail, the shear from the roof plywood has to get down into this plywood, right? Uh, so all the nailing that you see here, the nailing, the clips, the nailing for the shear wall, this plywood on the wall here comes down to here, nails through here, transfers and then comes through here. All of that nailing is there for a reason, so that the shear can transfer from one part of the roof to the other. And you can, now that you understand, now that you know, we've, we've been talking in these parts about that structural chain, that load path, now when you look at this detail, you understand what's going on. You're seeing that, you know, essentially, if I've got a force here, that force has to somehow get down to here. And all the stuff in between is what's, is what's doing that, that job. Okay. Now, remember, uh, thinking in three dimensions, not only do you have uh, forces acting in the plane of the detail, but you also have forces acting this way, right? Uh, and so you'll notice uh, framing clips here. Essentially, what if this roof at the bottom tries to pull away from that wall? We provide a connector here to, to help that uh, resist that pull away force and, and keep the house, keep the roof uh, together. Okay, and we're going to see some photos of that uh, here in, in a moment. So, uh, these are some real world examples of what we just talked about in that other detail. Okay, so what we have here is we have a tracked home, and beyond this wall, so this is a this is a wall on the second floor of our house, and beyond this wall there's a roof, and the roof is coming in. And the roof is kind of like here, right? Now, what if the roof on the other side of this wall in an earthquake tries to pull away from the wall, tries to separate? Well, we're providing these clips, metal clips. So these clips go through the wall plywood and they tie in, uh, they tie into the roof beyond to, 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 to keep the two components together, all right? And then here, uh, here's an example of uh, nailing from the inside of the wall to the ledger beyond. So again, uh, there's a roof beyond the wall and uh, this nailing uh, is tying the um, ledger of that roof to the wall. Now, that works okay for vertical forces and it works okay for shear forces this way, but does that handle pull out forces this way? No. If that roof beyond wants to pull out, what do you have? You have nails in withdraw. And remember, the building code does not allow you to use nails in withdraw to resist structure structural forces. So uh, in a case like this, in addition to this nailing, you would also need to provide these clips. Okay. So remember, all three directions goes back to thinking in three dimensions. You've got vertical force, Shear force in one direction and shear force in the, in, in the other direction. All right. Uh, essentially the same concept here. I've got a roof on a gable end that's framing into a wall. Now, the wall provides vertical support, so that's taken care of. Now, I have shear acting in the plane of the detail, right? So you'll notice I have nailing, I have shear paneling. So I've carried those two forces, but what about wind or seismic forces acting this way, pushing, uh, pushing on the wall? These studs are not full height, right? There's a top plate there and then it continues here. So in this instance, where you have forces acting this way, uh, you're going to have to provide some kind of uh, bracing element and that's exactly what we've got here. These two buys brace the wall. And you see this not only in stick frame construction, you see it in trusses as well. If you, if you look at a tracked home, you'll see that there's diagonal bracing coming down to brace the walls at the roof or at the ceiling level. So that's exactly what's happening here. This force here is being transferred uh, to this 2 by, which then transfers, uh, transfers up safely to the roof and provides global stability. If this 2 by wasn't here, you've got a hinge point right here, and that wall, is, that wall would not be stable. All right, so we've talked about all of the details at the roof and what they do and why they're there. And uh, 
Um, now let's move down to the floor. What I've got here is these are the details, a couple different options, uh, details at the shear transfer from the second floor shear wall to the first floor shear wall. And you can see all the connections. So, just like every other detail we've looked at, let's talk about the chain, the structural chain. I've got shear in the plywood, comes down, transfers through this edge nailing into that block. Then I've got nailing from the block through the floor and into this rim board. So all the shear from the second floor shear wall and the second floor diaphragm goes into that rim board. Then I have these uh, uh, metal clips to transfer that force down to this plate through this nailing and into that shear wall. It's a comp so you can see the complete chain. If I was to remove those metal clips right there, I've just removed one link from my chain. You know? And what is a chain that's missing a link? Well, you don't have a chain anymore. So uh, each one of these connections is so very important. You know, sometimes on a job, an inspector might come out if you're a builder or, or an owner builder or, or a contractor. You know, you might think, oh man, you know, the inspector wouldn't pass me just because of those, those a few nails over here or, I, you know, all I missed was this one part of the nailing, but I got everything else. Well, the reason for that is, is because 90% uh, of the chain isn't good enough. For the chain to work, you need 100% of the chain. You need every link of the chain to be in place for it to, for it to behave properly. Okay, uh, this is uh, the detail where the framing is going the other direction. And then here, here's another option. Um, you know, there's, there's usually more than one way to do uh, structural connections. Here I have the plywood come down, but instead of the plywood stopping right here, the plywood continues down and nails onto that plate. I'm sorry, it nails onto the rim board. So notice some of the connections are, are eliminated here. You know, some, some of the connections that you see here are not provided on this detail. Well, why? Well, look at the chain now. I've, I've, I've simplified the chain to the plywood comes down, transfers right through the rim board and then right back into the plywood and down. So that's, that's just as equally valid a way of, uh, of, of framing a house as this other, this other method here. Okay? But again, the concept is the same. As long as I've got a complete chain, a complete load path, uh, I'm good. Okay, down to the foundation. Uh, let's first talk about our standard uh, footing detail that, that you see for, uh, for foundations. Um, so here at the, at the first floor shear walls, this plywood here at the first floor is carrying all the shear of the house, right? All the shear at some point ends up in this plywood. Then when I come down to this point, I've got uh, edge nailing here, and those nails transfer the force into the plate, the, the sill plate, and then through the anchor bolts into the foundation. Not a very complicated chain here. Plywood, nailing, plate, anchor bolts, footing. Okay. This nailing here is probably the most important nailing uh, in a house. Uh, all of the shear in the house at some point will go through that bottom sill nailing. And if that nailing is not done right, uh, you, know, you can have a catastrophic failure uh, in an earthquake. Now, another thing you'll notice is the nailing here is galvanized. The reason for that is the bottom sill plates that we use uh, are uh, sometimes protected with a corrosive uh, treatment. So to keep the wood from rotting, they treat it. And that treatment that they use is sometimes corrosive to metal. So you'll notice that uh, most projects, they'll use galvanized nails. Now, you can order some uh, lumber that, uh, for that bottom plate that does not use corrosive chemicals. Uh, but normally what we see is galvanized uh, edge nailing uh, being, uh, being used there. Okay? Uh, but there's your typical, uh, your typical foundation detail uh, for a home. And then... This is a grade beam detail. This would be the detail that you would see uh, at the uh, garage shear walls. 
Remember those manufactured shear walls that had very high overturning forces? Okay, very heavy hold downs. You'll notice the, the footing here is simp just very simply reinforced. It has two bars at the top and two bars at the bottom. And then if the footing is poured with two pores, then you'll see uh, dowels in between, you know, these, these, uh, these dowels right here. A grade beam has heavier reinforcing, more rebar at the top and bottom, and you'll also notice that it has ties around the rebar. Uh, those ties confine the concrete and increase its strength, provide more shear strength, and uh, basically a stronger foundation. All right, so you'll see uh, grade beams uh, where you have heavy, heavy, uh, heavy shear walls. Okay, uh, some photos here illustrating uh, roof drag struts, or the other term that we use is collectors. The term drag strut and collector are basically the same. Uh, again, uh, uh, I'm, I'm putting this toward the uh, you know toward the end of our presentation because our example home did not include these but they are important and you do see them on a lot of homes and I felt that they should be included in this presentation. Um, now again, what is a collector? A collector transfers load from the diaphragm, from the roof, collects it and then transfers it to the shear wall and that's exactly what we're seeing here. So what we've got is uh, roof trusses, right? That's the bottom cord of our truss. We've got another truss here. So these are all roof trusses and the, the roof plywood is, is above somewhere up here. All the shear from the roof in this area is transferred through the nails into this blocking and then down. So these arrows indicate that the shear is coming down and then it transfers into this steel strap. And if you look closely you'll see there's a, there's a steel strap that runs along the length here. Okay. And then right here, that steel strap continues to run. You can't see it, but that steel strap continues and ties into a shear wall right here. So it's a structural chain. It's a load path. Force from the roof, transfers down, gets collected in that metal strap, and then unloaded into the shear wall. All right. If any one of those components is missing, you don't have a chain. This is yet another example of the same thing. The roof sheathing isn't on yet, but when the roof sheathing is put on, you'll notice that I've got trusses. This is the bottom cord of a truss. This is the bottom cord of a truss. And then I've got blocking panels. You know, I've got one blocking panel here, another blocking panel here, and so on. The shear comes down through the blocking. And you'll notice, see how the steel strap is, is just draped off the end there? Because they haven't finished it. You know, the house is still in frame. But that steel strap will run. It'll continue to run along and all the shear from the roof will be collected in that steel strap and then eventually unloaded into the shear wall. And you see the plywood there? That's the shear wall. Basically the exact same thing that we saw uh, in, that, in that detail there. Okay? Um, and, and you know again, this was not part of our um, example home, but it's important. And it also illustrates the point that the concepts we've talked about today the concept of the structural chain, uh, force transfer, and following the load path, you will, you will apply those concepts to any structure. Uh, you know, concrete building, steel building, just because we've been talking about wood today doesn't mean that these concepts don't apply to any other building. Uh, the, 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 the structural load path and force transfer is the same. Uh, the physics of the structures is the same, really no matter what material uh, that you build it out of, these basic concepts are the same. Now, obviously in other materials you'll run into more complicated physics and more complicated concepts, but the basics that we've talked about today you can really apply to any structure. Okay, shifting gears just a little bit. Um, question comes up, well what happens when structures are built, uh, designed or built improperly? All right. And I kind of alluded to this a little bit in, in one of the prior parts of the training, but I want to go, go into a little bit more detail now and just remind everybody that the loads we design structures for, uh, dead and live loads, earthquake loads, wind loads, and so forth, they're based on probabilities. So engineers do studies. Uh, we, we, we evaluate ground accelerations and live loads and all kinds of things. And we come up with factors of safety, 
probabilities that those loads will be there. For example, a roof is designed for 20 pounds of live load, right? Well, uh, that live load is really hardly ever there. The only time that live load is there is when someone's up on the roof, uh, either re-roofing or someone's walking up there for whatever reason. That's when you have that load. But uh, for the most part, the, the roof is only supporting the dead load. Okay, for 95% of the lifetime of the roof, it's only ever supporting the dead load, maybe 99%. But there's that 1% where the roof will be required to support uh, an additional live load. All right. Um, now, uh, an improperly built structure uh, may be able to stand under its dead weight for years without any problem. Uh, you know, we run into this a lot in building and safety. Uh, you know, someone's got a, an illegal structure that they built, and that illegal structure has been standing for 10 years. And we go out there and we say, well, we're sorry, this structure doesn't meet code. You need to pull a permit. You need to fix it. You need to bring it up to code. And uh, sometimes people get angry. You know, they say, well, wait a minute. What do you mean it doesn't meet code? I, I built that structure 10 years ago, and it, it hasn't fallen down. Well, the reason it hasn't fallen down is because we haven't had an earthquake. <laughs> or the, loads, the loads that you're required to design that structure for haven't been there yet. Uh, but one day, uh, they, they may. And uh, of course, we don't, we don't want to see an earthquake, but uh, it's been over 20 years since the last major earthquake in our area. And uh, we, you know, at some point, there will be another earthquake here. And uh, we want to make sure structures are safe. I put a photo here of a structure that uh, you know, a structure like this might stand for years, but will not perform under the code loads. You know, you've got a beam that's underdesigned; it's not properly braced. You've got a lacking uh, lateral system here, no shear walls or shear support. Uh, something like this, uh, you don't want to be underneath that structure in an earthquake. Um, you know, that's, that is a collapse hazard. And in 1994, structures like this did fall down. Uh, more than one. We had homes literally fail, split in half, homes come off their foundations, patios and other accessory structures like this literally collapsed in Santa Clarita. And we're not talk just talking a few. Uh, we're talking uh, literally hundreds of structures that were uh, complete losses. So uh, just something to keep in mind uh, uh, when, we, when we talk about design and uh, we talk about um, um, uh, structural safety uh, permits and inspections, you know, exactly what it is that we're, uh, that we're, that we're talking about. Now, uh, uh, let's talk about our example house. What if our example house was built improperly? Let's say that these shear walls uh, were missing uh, certain critical connections. What would happen? Okay. Well, we saw that in, in the 94 earthquake. Uh, buildings that are lacking shear support on one side do not perform well. You get what we call a torsional irregularity. And what, what essentially happens is the whole house twists. And uh, there were uh, many buildings in Northridge that had that irregularity. There was uh, one example uh, was a three-story condominium that, that uh, collapsed because of a torsional irregularity. And so uh, not building these things properly uh, is not an option. Uh, and, that's, and that's why we're here to make sure that things are done right. Um, you know, in a case like this where you have no redundancy, you're looking at a full collapse. Now, in a case like this where maybe this shear wall was eliminated, at least you have other shear walls that the load can transfer to, right? Still, in a big enough earthquake, if you eliminate a, a, a critical, you know, if you eliminate a shear wall, even if it's not a critical shear wall, if you eliminate a shear wall, if these walls were not designed to carry all of that force, you know, these walls were only designed to carry the force uh, that, that we assumed they took, uh, you know, from the roof and the floor. If you eliminate this wall, more shear force will go to this wall and the wall will fail. And, and you're looking at a, at a potential collapse uh, scenario. Okay, so uh, to end part four of our training, I just want to say thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, learn about the structures, get familiar with some of the new code provisions. And uh, the last thing I want to say is that uh, uh, here in Santa Clarita, Building and Safety, if you're in the city, if you're building in the city or you're submitting plans for design, we're available. Uh, the reason we're putting on this training on video is to help you, uh, to, to uh, give you the information you need to design and build 
code compliant and safe structures. And so we're here. Uh, we're not that hard to get a hold of uh, in building and safety. If you have any questions about uh, structures or any other code related questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, we've got friendly staff who uh, you know, are, are there to assist you with questions you may have and help you get through the permit process uh, to build safe uh, buildings which will add value to our city. Okay, So thanks again for taking the time to listen and uh, uh, feel free to contact Building and Safety if you have any, any further questions. Take care.